I'll never forget in 2006 when RightWingWatch.org added talk radio host Michael Savage to their hoary halls of passive-aggressive derision for making the statement that, quote, America needs another brave senator like Joe McCarthy in the midst of a monolithic rant about the Beverly Hills Bolsheviks of modern Hollywood. Do you know who McCarthy was? Of course you do. He was vilified by those in the fake news back in the 1950s. Senator McCarthy was a great man. He, in fact, was a tail gunner in World War II. And you know what the vermin in the media did? The, the people in the fake news in the 50s because he was anti-communist? Do you know what they did to him? They took his very heroism as a World War II hero and turned him into a crackpot. They called him tail gun something or other. In other words, they mocked his very, very heroism. And then they said he created a blacklist. Madman, they shrieked. Totalitarian tosspot, they might have shouted if they knew what either of those words mean. The problem? Both Michael Savage and Right Wang Watch were phenomenally fucking wrong. Savage, because he repeated the apocryphal assertion that Joe McCarthy had a preoccupation with communist Hollywood, and the disinformation mill of the new millennium right wing watch because they knowingly concealed the fact that Hollywood was, at the time of and just prior to the Army of McCarthy era, utterly awash with communism in every form and fucking facet. It's a lie agreed upon by contemporary media, which, as you'll learn in the confines of this video, is doubly suspicious because many of the very same media organizations that falsely report on the House Un-American Activities Committee were later linked to the communist front groups they fucking exposed. Say it loud, say it proud, the lie is dead, Hollywood was always red. So first things first, let's dismantle the dog shit du jour of every fuchsia quaffed Kaiser Chiefs aficionado filling out the black turtleneck department at Portland Juco. Why should you even care? This is America. Anyone can have any political opinion they want. Well, for one thing, they were directly funded by the Soviet fucking Union. Documents uncovered since the Berlin Wall went splitsky reveal the USSR corkscrew pile drove its ideology into American entertainment media to the tune of roughly two million dollars annually as recently as the 1980s. California Congresswoman Helen Gahagan Douglas, a leftist Democrat who had been a member of the HICCASP, a communist front group, would later be quoted as saying, no sooner had the shooting in World War II stopped than the expansionist policies of the Soviet Union created a new threat to the security of Western Europe. So you can scoff and say, what would inserting communist propaganda into our entertainment even accomplish all you like? The Soviets evidently saw enough return on their investment to spend roughly the same amount the average political candidate in America spends on ads every election cycle, except they did it every year, on the year, for 60 fucking years. In fact, I would argue that to comprehend the communistic underpinnings of Hollywood is to comprehend California politics at all. Operating from the Soviet consulate in, you guessed it, sunny San Francisco, a city the Soviets dubbed codename Babylon, orders and money were taken alternately from the Kremlin and Communist Party USA HQ in New York City. Key figures such as Ella Winter and Donald Ogden serving as go-between in the nascent days of Tinseltown before finding themselves entrenched in the American Union system. Hollywood unions being the primary facilitator of communistic control in this instance. The knot work of alphabet soup union front groups would take hours to itemize, frankly, but I'll throw a few names at you and recommend you research them at your leisure, because this rant isn't really about the logistics of how the communists seize control of Hollywood. The Conference of Studio Unions, founded by ardent communist union leader and frankly fucking thug Herb Sorrell, whose repeated riot incitement opened the initial investigation to begin with, the HICCASP, or Hollywood Independent Citizens Council of Arts, Sciences, and Professions, they love their acronyms, an arguably unconstitutional attempt to promote FDR's New Deal programs that gradually devolved into a hotbed of communistic thought. Hell, even FDR himself was hoodwinked into joining a communist union front, the Screenwriters Guild, which you may have heard of in the recent Brian Cranston commie propaganda piece, Trumbo, the tale of a blacklisted bullshit merchant, Dalton Trumbo, which conveniently excises any and all of the screenwriters' incumbent membership in the Communist Party. And yes, because then as now, communists often couch their bullshit bullshit and anti-fascism, 
the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League, the latter organization being almost singularly responsible for the modern misconception that Walt Disney was, quote, anti-Semitic, an assertion that conveniently only materialized after Disney found himself in direct conflict with a cartoonist union later revealed to be affiliated with Herb Sorrell's aforementioned CSU. That's right, gang, the next time you see Seth MacFarlane, SNL, or the like, recite that trite horse shit about Walt Disney Holocaust denier? You said we were going to a place Walt Disney built. No, Peter, I said supported. Recognize it for what it is, the witless recitation of carefully cultivated communist propaganda flush from the pages of the Daily Worker, which is exactly where the allegations were originally printed, by the by. My artist came to me and told me that uh, Mr. Sorrell, Herbert Sorrell, was... Is that uh, Herbert K. Sorrell? Your Herbert impression? K. Sorrell. Uh, was trying to take him over. They had heard that I was going to sign with Sorrell, and they said that they wanted an election to prove that uh, Sorrell didn't have the majority, and I told Mr. Sorrell that there's only one way for me to go, and that was an election, and that's what the law had set up. The National Labor Board was for that purpose, and he laughed at me, and he said that uh, he used the Labor Board as it suited his purposes. Now compare the contemporary Disney politics with those of its founder, who overtly opposed communism in all of its forms. Think there's a rotisserie in that fucking coffin, folks? In fact, those racist World War II era Disney cartoons. Oh, so accordance. Oh, I beg my pardon. I bow my stomach at you, very reverent. That's all right. Happy cherry blossoms to you, please. My mm -hmm. boy, oh, so, oh, so, oh, so, oh, so, oh, so. Were in most cases written and illustrated by members of said cartoonist union, despite the fact that during the Hitler Stalin alliance several years previously, they had inexplicably gone from bash the fash to stick it in my gash. So the next time you see those buck tooth jap or robotic kraut caricatures in comics and old timey tunes, don't thank Joe McCarthy, thank Joe Stalin. Oh, but Razor, what about the Mephistophelian fuck knob responsible for every blacklisting butt fucking and baby murder of the fucking 50s? Our old pal, Jumpin' Joe McCarthy! <laughs> what the fuck about Joe McCarthy? Strap in, I'm about to blow your mind, bitch. Joe McCarthy? The man whose theatrics, hard drinking, and self-destructive accusations once led President Truman to describe him as, quote, the best friend the Kremlin ever had? Point blank. He never held one. Not one hearing about Hollywood communists. Drink it in, dipshits. You were lied to. The Army McCarthy hearings were held to confront not celluloid socialism, but rumored communistic corruption within the government and armed forces. Again, not the fucking film business. The first clue should have been the name. The House on American Activities Committee. How could Senator Joe McCarthy hold a hearing in the House of Representatives? Furthermore, they don't fit the fucking time frame either. The McCarthy hearings came over a half decade later in the mid-50s after two major inquests of Hollywood, both of which were infinitely more productive than the McCarthy hearings. The fact that despite this crucial distinction, we still somehow call the Hollywood blacklist hearings the McCarthy hearings is evidence of retroactive Hollywood propaganda in practice. And you should be wary of any teacher, politician, actor, or Antifa Aspie who employs the fucking term. You may be surprised, in fact, to learn the man who investigated, exposed, and was ultimately character assassinated and ostracized by communists and their trade union thralls in Hollywood was not a hard-drinking, fire-breathing Republican conservative, but a lifelong liberal union man and died in the dogshit Democrat named Roy Brewer. Ever heard his name? Of course you fucking haven't! Because given his background, he's virtually impossible for the left to demonize, and thus George Clooney didn't make a shit film about him. That the term McCarthyism, which originally coined in the pages of Communist Party dick rag The Daily Worker, should tell you all you need to know about how heavily the House Un-American Activities Committee narrative has been <clears throat> curated by the modern left. Fact is, there were not only communists in Hollywood, they were making expressively communist films. A list of the films the Communist Party scrubbed, inserting socialistic messages in with practice deliberation, you ask? 
Well, how's about Blockade from 1938, a surprise Henry Fonda film set in the Spanish Civil War whose pro-communist posturing was considered so overt by astute audiences of the era that they lined up in droves to not fucking see it, contributing to a loss of $130,000 in the process, no small sum in the late 30s. Its writer, John Howard Lawson, became one of the blacklisted Hollywood 10 and was caught forming talent guilds in, quote, cultural clubs in the Hollywood area that were functional fucking front groups. The question of communism is in no way related to this inquiry, which is an attempt to get control of the screen and to invade the basic rights of American Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. in all fields. You, you refuse to answer that question, is that correct? I have told you that I will offer right. my beliefs, my affiliations, and Excuse everything else Excuse to the, the American Chairman. public, and they will know where I stand, as they do from what I have written. After a brief exile in Mexico, he would go on to teach at Stanford University. Or what about Crossfire, which famed film noir director Ed Dimitrik later admitted his producer, blacklisted member Adrian Scott, inserted overt communist propaganda into. Things have been made of that. They, they've said that that was one of the reasons because we made the first picture about anti-Semitism and the right wing didn't approve of that. That's not true at all. Uh, it just happened that the two things more or less coincided. I had made the picture that year and they and the congressional hearings came up, but they had been planning the congressional hearings for years, long before they knew I was going to make a picture like Crossfire or something. So I had to, as they say, purge myself, which was not difficult for me to do because I, I was completely, you know, disillusioned about everything else. Or Salt of the Earth, a post-blacklist film thanks to Herb Sorrell helming a series of violent studio strikes throughout the 40s, Hollywood bosses had by the 50s wised up to the wiles of trade unions and their communistic underpinnings and so refused to fucking fund the film. How did the Reds rebuff the contention that they were using trade unions to manipulate us all into Marxism, you ask? by using a trade union to fund the fucking film, naturally. A blacklisted one, no less. The International Union of Mine, Mill, and Smelter Workers. A natural fit for fucking cinemaphiles. Today, the film's world-rending fucking failure is still blamed on McCarthyism, while blatant revisionism is even immortalized right there on the Wikipedia article that Joe McCarthy, as we've already established, never held one hearing on Hollywood to the modern left is utterly immaterial. The narrative is what matters, numbnuts. They need a punchable face to fucking lie about, and Joe McCarthy trumps Roy Brewer because a Democrat simply will not do. Even Western classic High Noon was written by Carl Foreman, a card-carrying communist, who fashioned the tale as a pistolero parable about one man standing up to the House Un-American Activities Committee. The irony, of course, being that well, no one actually did in real life. As actor Mark Lawrence later related, anyone who had the guts to say, I'm a communist and you want to cut my throat because that's what I believe, that's gutsy. But nobody did that. Unquote. They were far too busy cutting each other's throats, enacting the first iterations of the blacklist, not against those revealed as communists, but against those who acknowledge the immutable fact that there were, in fact, communists in Hollywood. Hilariously, the move to make High Noon a propaganda picture righteously backfired all in the family style, instead evolving into an ode to individualism when it emerged that it was the favorite film of famed Republican president Ike Eisenhower, noted communist propaganda rag The Daily Worker, not to mention the bright red New York Times, excoriated their own film. Probably the most notable anti-committee play and later film, however, would be Arthur Miller's The Crucible, almost single-handedly responsible for modern perpetuation of the omnipresent McCarthyist witch hunt myth. Has the devil got to you? God damn's all lies, Mary. Have you made compact with the devil to destroy this investigation? Mary, hold to the truth. What brought this change in you? You have made compact with the devil, have you not? Blatant revisionism even former communists mocked at the time. The wife of Elia Kazan, a Hollywood director who'd been hip deep in Bolshevik bullshit in the 30s, but turned informant in the 40s, famously fired back at Arthur Miller following the play's release. Quote, those witches did not exist. Communists do. Here, everywhere in the world, it's a false parallel. Witch hunt. That phrase would indicate that there are no communists in government, none in the big trade unions, none in the press, none in the arts, none sending money from Hollywood to 12th Street. No one who is in the party and the left uses that phrase. They know better. Unquote. 
Kazan would go on to direct On the Waterfront, effectively an analog for his experience turning on the communist propagandists of his youth and naming the names of his co-conspirators. You ratted on us, Terry! From where you stand, maybe, but I'm standing over here now. I was ratting on myself all them years, I didn't even know it. Come on! You think you're God Almighty, but you know what you are? You're a cheap, lousy, dirty, stinking mug! And I'm glad what I've done to you! You hear that? I'm glad what I done! Kazan would later say, quote, Every day I worked on that film, I was telling the world where I stood and my critics to go fuck themselves. Today, despite being passed over for Lifetime Directoral Achievement Awards by a Hollywood still very much beholden to Marxist ideology, while giving the very same awards to people like Ed Wood and Roger Corman, might I add, even the B-movie bullshies at Turner Classic Movies hail it as a modern masterpiece, albeit while spinning the production history so hard between commercial breaks they generate their own fucking orbit. After winning seven Oscars, Arthur Miller, the man most of you got your McCarthyist witch hunt narrative from, would commemorate the occasion by mailing its director a copy of his new play, A View from a Bridge, about a dock worker who informs on his union out of jealousy and spite and and nothing else. Subtle. When Kazan replied with a glib offer to direct the film version, Miller fired back, and I quote, I only sent it to let you know what I think of stool pigeons. Arthur Miller, ladies and gentlemen, the man whose politics are taught in every elementary school in America. No long-term societal side effects here. Throwing rocks at those windows, kicking the windows in. This is exactly what you don't want to see. You know, we just talked about it. This was a peaceful protest, and... It is anything but that right now. I mean, this is a this is a target story. He's going to throw a flare in the target. But of all the available counter narratives, why settle on a witch hunt? What have we learned over the last two years, Rageaholics, if not the left always accuse you of that which they are already guilty? In 1946, famed author Albert Maltz wrote a scathing indictment of propagandist Hollywood writers in the pages of New Masses magazine. It's online at several locations entitled, What Shall We Ask of Writers? I recommend you read it. This anti-indoctrinative invective was noteworthy because at the time, Albert Maltz was a communist. Here was a flag-waving hammer and sickle file with the intellectual honesty to be disquieted by the despotic tactics of his fellows. And he absolutely paid for it. A week of outright re-education at the hands of the Hollywood Communist Party ensued. A full-bore Inquisition-style interrogation headed and personally attended by V.J. Jerome, author, essayist, and primary ideological hitman for the New York headquarters of the Communist Party USA. Albert Maltz resisted at first, debating his points with alacrity but ultimately shattered, prostrating himself not only in print in an unqualified retraction of his previous article, but also in public, attending major Hollywood functions where he was impelled by Communist Party leadership to utterly humiliate himself by reciting the very same retraction in person. It was at this time that Elia Kazan, the aforementioned director of On the Waterfront and avowed functionary of the Hollywood Communist engine for over a decade, had simply had enough, testifying at the second round of House inquiries and naming names outright. In his own words, he'd quote, had enough regimentation, and that quote, the last straw came when I was invited to go through a typical communist scene of crawling and apologizing and admitting the error of my ways before a glorified inquisition board of the party's devising. Adding quote, it left me with a passionate conviction that we must never let the communists get away with the pretense that they stand for the very things that they kill in their own countries. And you actually testified against a lot of people that you'd worked with, and named right. a lot of names. What, what did you hope to gain by that? Gain nothing, it's just the truth. The only thing I had to gain was the feeling that I was doing the right thing. I didn't have a damn thing to gain about it. It meant a lot to me to, to say that... Uh, but a lot that, of people didn't do that, did they? They would have protected people that they'd known. Well, they can do it. They, can, they do what they thought was right. I did what I thought was right. I didn't like to do it, but I thought when I thought about it very carefully, I thought it was the better of two a mean alternative. Do you regret the decision now that you did that? No, I don't. I'm the opposite. I, uh, since everything has been revealed since then, I feel that anyone who's gone through Czechoslovakia, Hungary, the Nazi Soviet pack, and all the rest of it, who still goes on that way, uh, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't have sympathy. I think they should be brought up as I was to confront their past and say what they really think. You did, in fact, lose a lot of friends through that, and you were blacklisted for a time. 
Did it make it more difficult for you to work in Hollywood after that? It did, because I had a certain notoriety. It didn't make it more difficult for me to work. But uh, I don't mind losing friends if it's in a good cause. In short, the left go to the witch hunt well because they dug the damn witch hunt well. Contrary to the bullshit witch hunt narrative, there's no indication the House Un-American Activities Committee was done for political reasons of any sort. If anything, it cost the politicians conducting it, as the Daily Worker, not to mention undercover commies at more reputable publications like The Times, hailed criticism on their hapless heads. And so the first round of questioning, despite exposing an entire network of front groups, writers inserting agitprop into film prints with tendrils reaching not merely through Hollywood, but even exposing a communist double agent working directly for the Kremlin who incited a violent dock workers revolt in Seattle were hastily ended to save face. The so-called witch trials weren't started due to political reasons. They were ended for them. Not only were the hearings massively unpopular, thus excising any potential political gain, the inevitable counter-communist Hollywood Union, the League of Hollywood Voters, was helmed by none other than Ronald Reagan, at that time very much a Democrat and a Hollywood actor who had very nearly been unwittingly roped into one of CSU's many front groups years prior. I will be frank with you that as a citizen I would hesitate or I would not like to see any political party outlawed on the basis of its political ideology because we've spent 170 years in this country on the basis that democracy is strong enough to stand up and fight for itself against the inroads of any ideology no matter how much we may disagree with it however if it is proven that this organization is the agent of a foreign power or is in any way not a legitimate political party and i think the government is capable of doing that if the proof is there then that is another matter. More to the point, the politicians conducting the hearings were a portrait of reticence to begin with. Arthur Kessler, former communist and writer of the anti-Stalin screed Darkness at Noon, detailing the true conditions of Soviet Russia, was told point blank by committee member Bud Schulberg that while he hated communists, he didn't want to attack the left. Get over it, replied Kessler. Hollywood unions aren't left. They're east. Kessler was later discovered with his wife in an apparent double suicide under exceedingly suspicious circumstances. He was dubiously accused by feminist author and British Labour Party activist Jill Craigie of sexual assault in 1998, over ten years after his passing. Her claims were later found false by biographer Michael Scammell. Socialism. Same shit, different decade, folks. But that isn't even the most cavernous depths of the Hollywood left's contemporary hypocrisy. Because the House Un-American Activities Committee didn't invent the so-called blacklist either. Here again, Hollywood communists did. Stars from Lana Turner to Betty Davis to even Barbara Stanwyck were all blackballed and threatened with, quote, the striker's wrath if they went on shooting during Herb Sorrell's Hollywood riots of 1940. Which, much like Sorrell's previous communist incited riots at Paramount in 1930, were so violent more than 15 ambulances were needed to haul away the victims. Film noir classic, and God willing, subject of a future Film Noir Archives episode, The Blue Dahlia was one of dozens of films boycotted by the Communist Party USA, once again with Herb Sorrell's CSU providing the muscle. This despite one of the film's actors being Howard De Silva, a Communist Party hack man. Point blank, bitch, the so-called blacklist never did a thing that the American Communist his party didn't do first. I couldn't work for a left winger because he, I was a, a, a think, you know, a, a renegade. I couldn't work for the right wingers because they said once a communist, always a communist. In truth, the vast majority of communists exposed during the Un-American Activities Committee hearings were exposed not by some rampaging Republican or career-minded cocksure crusader, but by former commies themselves, many of whom were alienated either during the Stalinist purges or when Russia briefly allied with Nazi Germany, prompting a sudden and awkward change in ideology for the Communist Party USA, wherein they fumble-fucked their way from fashion to Hitler humping over all of a 12-hour fucking period. Overnight, the Communist Party's membership plummeted from tens of thousands to under 10K. Other defections were inspired by the newly emergent reality of life under the tyranny of Bolshevik Russia. It's almost impossible to convey to a free people what it's like to live in a totalitarian dictatorship. I can tell you a lot of details. I can never completely convince you because you are free. And it's in a way good that you don't it can't even conceive of what it's like. Certainly they have friends and mother-in-laws, 
they try to live a human life, but do you understand that it is totally inhuman? Now try to imagine what it's like if you are in constant terror from morning to night and at night you're waiting for a doorbell to ring. If you are afraid of everything and everybody. Morris Child, former Soviet double agent, flipped to the FBI during Joseph Stalin's Great Purge following World War II, a period in which Stalin reframed anti-Semitism as anti-Zionist, resulting in the infamous mass hangings in Eastern Europe while ordering the death or internment of countless communist Jews who failed to fall in line. Paul Robeson, actor Avery Brooks's commie idol, flew to the USSR, as was customary in Hollywood circles at the time, only to fail to find any of his Jewish musician friends, including actor-director Solomon Mikhaels. The Stalin regime kept Robeson occupied in the meantime, but in truth, the dictator had already ordered Mikhaels murder, a fact that came into full view when his broken body emerged in the public square the following morning. Robeson's other band members frantically tried to warn him, but Robeson, so married to his Marxist ideology, not only refused to entertain the notion, he left the country utterly unswayed, publicly declaring at a common turn function that, quote, anti-Semitism does not exist in the USSR. Unfucking quote Civil rights icon. Days later, the band member that had warned Robeson was murdered as well. The harrowing tales of these reformed communists are, by the way, relayed in the pages of The God That Failed, a highly recommended read and one of the primary sources for this video. The New York Times, meanwhile, earned a Pulitzer Prize for the Politburo pen craft of one Walter Durante, whose 9-to-5 occupation it was at the time to deny both the widespread starvation he was witnessing first fucking hand at the Russian office of the New York Times, not to mention the bloody Stalinist purges in the wake of World War II. For his flagrant lies, he was later interred on the famous Orwell list, cataloging writers who were never to be trusted to report information factually to British intelligence thereafter. Anything to upend the painstaking deception of the persecuted Hollywood communists, a myth that springs eternal in cinematic depictions to this day. Even now, this revisionist pablum is being taught in public schools. Samuel Butler once wrote in the pages of Erewhon, It has been said that God cannot alter the past. Historians can, and therein lies the most egregious modern oversight of all, because schools aren't even the primary custodians of the anti-blacklist narrative. In an Olympic conflict of interest, Hollywood itself has been left largely in charge of disseminating the tale of its own communistic origins. The way they've chosen to handle these depictions offers some of the most compelling evidence that the party remains alive and well, albeit in heavily altered form, even today. World-class Woody Allen agitprop picture, The Front, features such flagrant disinformation as opening with a close-up shot of Joseph McCarthy, who, as we've already established, never once held a single inquest into communists in Hollywood, and wading even further into the fuckmire by having one character, a communist writer being questioned by the committee, produce the defiant utterance, And furthermore, <clears throat> you can all go fuck yourselves. Fairy tales can come true. Something not one person in two hearings and hundreds of witnesses ever came close to uttering in real life. It's a mortal motherfucking certainty there will be what I loosely classify as people in this very comments section who will attempt to refute the contents of this video with willful disinformation called, from good night and good luck, the fucking front or other such Hollywood hack jobs. It's that ubiquitous. Why the flagrant reframing? Let us revisit an author as talented as he is overquoted. He who controls the present controls the past. He who controls the past controls the future. George Orwell, 1984. To have the faintest fucking hope of retaking the future, we must first obliterate the desultory disinformation mongering of the past. The myth of the noble put upon Pinko's braving the travails of McCarthy's acid tongue and ulcer-addled stomach is among the most blatant lies you've swallowed in your ever-loving lives. Spit it up and breathe the breath of the fucking free, my friends. When somebody points out the obvious Antifa symbology in, say, the new Robin Hood trailer, don't hand wave it away as immaterial. Don't scoff and chalk it up to Californian insularity and elitism. Hollywood didn't turn, commie. It was redder than a baboon's ass from word fucking go. Did McCarthy do something wrong? You're damn right he did. He stopped. I'm Razor Fist. God. Fucking speed!
You talk like a radical, but you live like a rich guy. It's the perfect combination. The radical may fight the purity of Jesus, but the rich guy wins with the cunning of Satan.